All right, let's uh, start the third talk of this session. We have uh, Jan Hein Biermann here, uh, who is going to talk about when to refactor your code into generators and how. Thank Take you. It away. Thank you. All right, let's start. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. I hope everything, everybody is doing fine uh, here at the venue, but also perhaps the viewers uh, at home. Um, so let's start with my presentation, when to refactor your code into generators and how. All right, so the goals of this presentation are uh, that I hope that after this presentation you will be able to recognize certain loop constructs uh, as candidates for refactoring. Uh, and know how to convert these constructs into more maintainable and Pythonic code by refactoring them into elegant pipelines of generators. And finally, uh, you will be more acquainted with the standard library iter tools module and the more iter tools uh, package. But first, let's introduce myself. My name is Jan Heim Buurman. Uh, uh, you see my uh, email address and my Twitter handle over there. As you can see in the email address, I'm working for Ordina already more than 10 years now. The time flies when you're having fun. I witnessed, and a long time ago, more than 30 years ago, I witnessed the first baby steps of uh, Python when I was working at the Dutch Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science. And uh, during my career, I was working as a C++, C++ developer, but I had also management uh, roles. But uh, I always kept an eye on Python and its, uh, it advanced, uh, its developments and how it uh, progressed. And while being a Java unit manager at my current company, I sparked the idea for starting up a dedicated Python uh, practice, the Ordina Pythoneers. And I think it's quite special for a broad spectrum IT service provider to have a Python dedicated unit uh, within and where we combine uh, software, uh, uh, ethics, software development ethics, or uh, software development uh, uh, craftsmanship together with, uh, with, with Python. We, we like that combination. And uh, finally, the Ordina Pythoneers are a participating sponsor of the PSF. And the last four years, I'm working as a Python programmer, as a happy Python coder. All right, so the topic we will be addressing is, uh, first of all, I'm gonna show you some code with, with certain kind of loops, which have a cer certain pattern. These loops have similar code, but they have varying start, stop, and selection criteria. And I'll give a short, uh, I then I'll address the topic of uh, refactoring, and how you can recognize certain patterns of loop constructs for refactoring candidates. Then I touch upon the topic of generators, and I will introduce you to the earlier mentioned uh, uh, it's a tools module and the tools package. So let's start. So this is, uh, I'm gonna tell you a story, but it is a fictional story, it's not a true story. Um, it's a story about uh, that, we're, that we're working in a team and we have a product owner who is re representing the F Fibonacci sequence uh, fan club and he would like you to make a function returning a list of Fibonacci numbers which are less than a certain value. So first of all, who knows what a Fibonacci number is? I see many hands, perhaps not 100%, but close to it. Uh, so a short, short introduction to Fibonacci numbers. I'll just read it out. In mathematics, the Fibonacci numbers form a sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, in which each number is the sum, sum of the preceding two ones. So that's the essence of the Fibonacci sequence. You start with two numbers, usually it's zero and one, the next value is simply the addition of the previous two. So in this example, you see the first numbers are 0 and 1. If you add them together, one, 0 plus 1 makes 1, right? So that's the reason why you see another 1 in the sequence. And then the next value is cal calculated by taking the two previous ones uh, uh, of the next value, which are 1 plus 1, and that makes 2, etc., etc. 1 plus 2 makes 3, 2 plus 3 makes 5, and then you, then you get this sequence. So that's the essence of the, the Fibonacci sequence. So let's start coding that in, in Python. And if you Google around a little bit, perhaps you end up with the tutorial of, the Python, uh, of Python itself. Uh, 
where the uh, a variation of this uh, function is actually written out has another name it doesn't take it doesn't contain uh, type annotations but for the rest it's the same it doesn't contain a doc string either uh, but uh, it works as follows you you initialize your function uh, you initialize uh, the result value as an empty list and you start initializing the two what you could call the could call the, the Fibonacci registers a and b and you could view a as the current Fibonacci number and b as the next to come Fibonacci number and as long as your current Fibonacci number is less than the then the threshold that you have given as, a, as an argument, as a parameter to your function, then you enter the loop, you append the current, current uh, Fibonacci number to, uh, to the list, you calculate the, new the, the, the two new uh, registers, and that is the, the new current Fibonacci number is the old value of the, is the old next Fibonacci number, so A becomes B, and at the same time, that's nice from Python, you can make this kind of uh, funny, uh, how you call it, tuple assignment. You can uh, calculate a new uh, next to come Fibonacci number by adding the old values of A and B together. And that you, that's what you store in the B variable. And as long as the, the condition holds, you just simply repeat that. And then finally at the end, you return the resulting list. So looks, uh, looks great, seems to work. Everything has been tested by the way, so uh, this is what this will be working and uh, the product owner is uh, happy with the result and he wants more. So he now asks us, can you also make a function that returns the nth Fibonacci number counting from zero? Uh, so it means that uh, if you ask for Fibonacci number zero, then you get the first one. If you ask for Fibonacci number one, you get the second one and so, and so on and so on. We, in, we programmers like to index from zero onwards. So let's code that one looks a bit the same but also a bit different it doesn't return a list it just returns one Fibonacci value but again you have these a and B registers works the same you make up a, you make a counter but you don't need the counter valuable you only use it to, to to iterate a certain times through this loop and you calculate the the, the current Fibonacci number and when your have uh, calculated that, that many n, that many n times, then you can return the current Fibonacci number. Um, all right, so product owner now really gets an enthusiastic and he says, okay, well, can you now make also another function which uh, provides the first n Fibonacci numbers? So not Fibonacci numbers up to n, but the first n, and perhaps also a function that gives me the smallest Fibonacci number greater than or equal to, the, to a certain value. All right, we start coding again. So here's the first implementation. Here we are returning a list again. Uh, you use this counter, what you have seen from the construct uh, before, and you append the current the Fibonacci values to the list, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then you return the result. And the, the, the last one, the smallest fib greater equal n. Um, it's a bit different, uh, there you, uh, go into the loop and as long as the current Fibonacci number is less than n, you simply continue until you, uh, that condition do does no longer hold and then you return the, the current value because that is then equal to n or greater than n. So now we have four functions and in my original presentation there were even five, but it makes the story a bit boring perhaps. Uh, and these uh, line up nicely together in this uh, matrix so here you have uh, the condensed form of these four functions together. And um, I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm seeing a pattern. Do other people also are seeing some sort of pattern or whatever? Um, you see the pattern explained over here. Uh, because for all those functions, Function starts with a name, it accepts some parameter, a threshold or whatever, or an index kind of value. And uh, uh, sometimes you need to in initialize a container, a, a list in our case. Then you initialize these Fibonacci registers, the A and the B. Then you go into some while loop or a for loop uh, uh, with certain ending conditions. And then you are in the loop uh, calculating the new values of this uh, of the, the Fibonacci registers. And then at the end, you return the current Fibonacci number 
or you're returning the, 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 the container where you've put in all the numbers. So that's the pattern. And as, uh, so there is a lot, there is a bit of duplication in this code, right? And you don't like duplicate code because you, you might run the risk that you, for one of the four implementations, you just missed, missed it, did, did it wrong. So you want to try to factor out the common code which is present in, this, uh, in these functions. So how to get rid of the, the, re the redundancy of this code? And that's where, where this talk is about. It seems to be quite difficult. But in general, if you want to, want to get rid of redundancy, uh, you, you would refactor your code and uh, extract that part. So uh, first a question, who knows what refactoring is? Yeah, many hands, great, great, great. Uh, yeah, so refactoring is about that you restructure your code without changing the external behavior. But you usually do this to improve the design, the structure, and the implementation of the code. But you make sure that the original functionality of the code remains the same. And uh, you do this for a reason, because your code becomes more read readable, less complex, and better maintainable. All right, let's, you try to extract these common parts. You can of course extract that single line, the A and B initialization, put that in, an, in a function or something like that. It's quite useless, right? You replace one line by another line. So that doesn't seem to work. You can replace that other line where you are calculating the new Fibonacci registers, which is happening in the loop. Doesn't look very sensible either. So you are kind of stuck. How can you refactor it? it Perhaps you should combine the, the, f the functionality of all these functions into one super function, which is able to do all these different kind of calculations uh, depending on the mode flag. Eh? You could make an, uh, an enum, for example, the, uh, designating the mode where the function is running in. Um, uh, we could try it first with just uh, combining the first two functions of this story and then not using an enum, but just a boolean designating the mode of the, of the function. So, oh, I should have warned you. you per first you had to put on your, your parasensitive sunglasses on because this code uh, really hurt, is hurting uh, the eye. I, 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 I hope you agree. Uh, it starts already with the ugly type annotations. I don't know, everybody has seen the, the, the keynote of uh, Bukas Langa and uh, Ugly type annotations are also an indication of ugly code. Uh, in this case, also, it's a bit strange that this function is either returning an int or a list of integers. So it doesn't make sense to explain. How this code is working, by the way, but it doesn't make sense to, to explain this code. So this is not the way to go. Uh, it's also a bit of a contrived example, of course, but it's just uh, to demonstrate that the resulting code is not quite maintainable, and this is not the way to go. So again, how to refactor this? Well, I think the, the, the key thing is here that you have to take a step back. You have to more conceptualize the things that are happening in your code. Uh, perhaps fly on a higher, uh, higher altitude, so to say. And if you do that and you start thinking about what is this code actually doing, actually it's doing two things or one thing which is common for all the code and that is that uh, a part of it is producing these Fibonacci numbers and the other part of all these respective functions is doing something else. It's dealing with ending a loop criteria or the way the, the values are collected in a container or that you are working towards the, 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 the final calculated uh, Fibonacci number. So that is the separation that you can mentally make uh, in this code. Um, so, as, as you, as you see, when you see that you have some sort of, you have code where you do things, but you also have a data producing part in that code, then you might be thinking of this refactoring pattern. Because the data producing part is the part that you can actually quite easily isolate. But how will you do this uh, isolation? Well, for that, I need to uh, introduce uh, another concept, and that are the generator functions. Um, yeah, a generator function, uh, when you call this function, it 
creates an iterator, a generator iterator. And uh, if you code a, a function, it's quite, quite, it's just like you're coding a function, except it's it, in the simplest form, it just doesn't contain any return statements. It contains yield expressions. Um, and and if, if a function contains a yield expression, then it automatically, automatically becomes a function, uh, a generator function. Um, and the yield ex expression is used to give back a value to the caller, but not all values, only one value at a time. So um, you can use, for example, such a function in, uh, 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 in a for loop or some other thing that can deal with iterators, right? Um, so each time uh, that, you, uh, that the caller, the consuming party, needs another value, um, the, the generator, um, uh, well, it starts with the generator giving its first value back, right? And then when it does so, it, it uh, saves its state and it passes control back to the calling code, to the consuming code. And uh, once the consuming party needs another value, then the, the generator is revived. It, uh, it, it starts where it left off. It, it, it still has his, the value. All the local vari variables still have their own value. And it can produce the next value, and so on, and so on, until some ending criteri criteria is met or something else. Or the consuming party doesn't need any more values. So that's how it sort of works. So then the next question is, how can you code a generator function? How can you code a generator function producing these Fibonacci numbers? Well, that's this lovely, elegant piece of code, I would say. Uh, let's call it a FibGen, a Fibonacci generator. And this function generates an endless sequence of Fibonacci numbers until your memory in your computer cannot cope with the, the ultra large numbers that you're producing. And you, you, you recognize some, some familiar parts uh, in this code, I, I guess, because here you're again, before you enter the loop, you you're initialize your, your Fibonacci uh, registers, A and B, to the starting values 0 and 1. And then you enter an endless loop while through, and there you yield this first uh, Fibonacci number. And um, uh, then the consuming party can do something with that number. And then uh, after that, when the consuming party wants another uh, element, then your function, generator function continues. So you start calculating the next values, A and B, with the familiar formula. You go, you loop again into the same loop and you yield the next value and it stops again. So that's how it works. And in my view, what you see here is perhaps the most canonical coded representation of the Fibonacci sequence when you would code it in an imperative style. You could also express it in a more recursive style, but if you express it in an imperative style, it would look like this, I would say. The next question is, how can you use this, this generator? Well, uh, on, on the REPL, eh, on, on, the, on the, the, the read evil print loop, it would look like this. Um, for example, if you want to print the first eight Fibonacci numbers, then uh, uh, you, make the, you can write this loop. What you do is you, you're using the zip function to zip together a counter, a range of 10. It will give you uh, the values 0 to 9. You don't need those values. Uh, they are uh, zipped and they end up in the underscore variable. And you call the Fibonacci generator. And those values end up in the FIP variable in this loop. And then you simply print this uh, FIP variable. And then this is how you can use this, uh, this generator. So you could say we're set, we're ready, and uh, you have a long break. But uh, perhaps there's a little bit more to it because we can go one step further. And that is by using uh, uh, some beautiful building block that's provided by the Python standard library and uh, the Ithertools module uh, uses, uh, provides a lot of these nice building blocks. Um, here it says uh, the module standardizes core set, a core set of fast memory efficient tools that are useful by themselves or in combination. Together they form an iterator algebra, I would say a pipeline of iterators, 
making it possible to bootstrap specialized tools succinctly and efficiently in pure Python. Um, and there's another module, which is called, uh, it's not a module, it's a package. You can fetch it from PyPy, Py, 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 Py. Uh, the more it tools uh, package. And the more it tools package implements many of the, the documented recipes, which you can read in the, in the it tools module, and a lot of more, a lot more convenient uh, helper uh, routines. So those tools to the rescue, um, in the sense that you can make things even more compact. Um, for example, um, uh, let's start with the explanation of the take while uh, function that you see here. Um, and the take while uh, takes a predicate function. It's just a function of returning a falsy or a true fee value. Uh, and the function will be called with the current value that is given back by the, by the iterable. And in our case, the iterable is fibgen. And um, if you, um, you write a, a, a lambda expression, um, you see that uh, as long as the, the current uh, number that is given back by the Fibonacci generator is less than the, the, the end parameter, it returns a true value. In this case, actually, it's actually just true. And then uh, the value is passed on by take while. And um, um, as soon as the condition does not hold any longer, then the, 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 the generator is shut off, so to say, and um, you're set. And all these values that have been uh, passed through also as an iterable from take while are collected uh, in a list by using the list constructor. So this first fun function that we have written can also be expressed in this way using the, the iter tools. Um, same for the second function. Uh, here we are gonna use uh, the i slice function from it the iter tools module. And there is in two forms, the sim and the i slice function is just like you would like to use slicing with lists, right? You, you remember this syntax with the, the square brackets and the colons, where you can provide a start, a stop, and the step value. Well, the i slice is the equivalent of that, but then for iterators, except that you are, cannot provide negative values for either for one of these uh, parameters. So there are, two there are two forms, or you provide only the stop value, the stop index, index between quotes, or you provide uh, the, the start index, the stop index, and the step index, but there must be non-negative. Um, and we have another tool from the more iter tools package, which is called one. And uh, the, the one function uh, uh, accepts an iterable, and it uh, makes sure that the iterable only contains exactly one value, not zero, not more, exactly one. And if it contains this value, then it extracts that uh, from, the, from the sequence and uh, returns it as a value. So with the combination of these functions, you can implement the second, uh, the, the second function that was uh, requested by the product owner. So, well, uh, we can continue like that. Um, uh, for example, here we have uh, the, the iSlice, uh, uh, this, this is the first function. Here we use the iSlice function in the one index form, the st only the stop value. This, this is the one with the first n fibs. And finally, the smallest fib, you remember we had the the, the, the previous function where we were using the take while, and this one is using the, the drop while. So this one also takes a predicate function and it will drop any value as long as the, the, the condition holds. And once the condition does not longer hold, it will start passing through the values that it gets from the iterator. And the first function from the more iter tools package just selects the first value and returns that one. So uh, that's how, uh, how you can implement the, the, last, uh, the last requested function. So this, uh, now we're moving towards the end of the presentation, I would say. Um, uh, I would encourage you to read through the documentation of the iter tools package, uh, the iter tools module and the more iter tools package. It's a, a very valuable collection and uh, you can use it uh, perhaps more frequent than you, than you were thinking. And if you have an idea what it all has to offer, then uh, it can make your code more expressive as well. Um, so uh, that's my, my plea and uh, part of uh, the goal of this presentation. And just to, to, uh, to, to tease you a little bit, for example, 
suppose you have a, a, a massive amount of data, bulk data that you need to put into a database. And you, you're using some sort of uh, ORM, like a SQL Alchemy, to put it in. Then sometimes it's, it could be useful um, to, to, to put it in chunks. Yeah, I'm still there. In large chunks um, instead of uh, all the data in one go. And then, for example, you can use the, the more into tools chunks or the I chunked uh, uh, function of this uh, module. So that's it. So the recap is uh, we are now perhaps more able to recognize a certain pattern of certain loops constructs as candidates for refactoring. Uh, you know uh, uh, what generator functions are and how, how you can use them to extract the data producing part out of your entangled code. And uh, you have uh, an, a made acquaintance with the Itatools module and the more Itatools, Itatools uh, package. Uh, here are, are some uh, resources and links. I was inspired by uh, Wikipedia for the definition of Wiki, uh, the Fibonacci number, code refactoring, the Python glossary uh, contains the generator function definition and the documentation of Hitler tools and more Hitler tools. And I would like to thank you. You can uh, check my, uh, you can check out my uh, repository. Don't look into its history, but hit the final result, please, on the main branch. <laughs> um, and and actually, perhaps uh, as as an additional note. Um, uh, I, I have used uh, PyTest BDD, Behavior Driven Development, Gerging Language, to test uh, all the functions that, are, that you've seen. Actually, what you, the functions that you've seen in this listing are actually from the repo uh, as a link, LinkedIn, so to say. And um, so uh, the, the code that has been shown is uh, working code, and I've used uh, PyTest BDD to test both the, the pre-refactoring and the post-refactoring variants, and even that weird combination function for its, uh, for its correct uh, working. And I understand that uh, questions, it's better to uh, get them uh, later on or perhaps uh, in, the, in the alley or, so I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, hope to speak to you later.